the 12th of April, 1981, Kennedy Space Center, Florida. The sun hangs low over the coast. Visibility is crystal, 21 degrees Celsius, perfect. Between curtains of steam stands the promise of a new era, Space Shuttle Columbia. Two solid boosters, one giant orange tank, the white orbiter gleaming. In the control room, silence with a pulse. T minus 10, nine, eight, Light seven. floods the pad. The ground trembles. The sky turns orange. Columbia lifts, slow, then sudden. The thunder arrives a heartbeat late. Eight minutes later, she's in orbit. Up to that day, humans reach space on disposable towers of fuel. Light it, ride it, throw it away. The shuttle promised something smarter. Launch like a rocket, work in orbit like a truck and crane, land like an airplane, and do it again. Reuse would make spaceflight routine, affordable, safe. That was the dream that launched an era. Here's your hook to stay with me. By the end of this video, you'll be able to explain in one sentence why rockets beat shuttles on cost. You'll be able to spot the design choices that make or break safety. And you'll be able to decode any launch you see on TV like you've been doing it for years. Let's make the machine simple. The White Orbiter is the spacecraft you picture. Cockpit, wings, a huge payload bay, and three main engines clustered in the tail. Those engines are RS-25s, high-performance, liquid-fueled, and brutally complex. The big orange cylinder is the external tank. It feeds those engines liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen during ascent. The two white side rockets are solid rocket boosters. They provide the brute force off the pad. Here's how a launch actually starts. Six seconds before liftoff, the orbiter's main engines light. The whole stack stays clamped to the ground while the computers verify the engines are healthy. At zero, the solids ignite. Only then does the tower leap. Two minutes later, the solids burn out, separate, and fall away under parachutes for recovery from the ocean. The external tank rides along another six or so minutes, then it drops away and breaks up in the atmosphere. From there, the orbiter flies alone. Here's a detail you can pull out at your next dinner table debate. The fuel that powers those main engines also cools them first. Liquid hydrogen is so cold, around minus 250 Celsius, that engineers pump it through channels around the combustion chamber and nozzle before it ever burns. The stuff that will make the metal glow keeps that metal alive long enough to do its job. It's called regenerative cooling, elegant and essential. Once in orbit, the shuttle is more than a winged capsule. Two orbital maneuvering system engines in the tail make the major burns that change the size and shape of the orbit. Dozens of tiny reaction control system thrusters rotate and nudge the vehicle with millimeter precision. With that toolkit and the Canadarm Arm robotic arm, crews deployed satellites, grabbed them back, repaired the Hubble Space Telescope, and carried building-sized modules to the growing International Space Station. The shuttle was a lab, a crane, and a truck-in-one airframe. Coming home flips the script. The orbiter turns tail towards space, and the OMS fires for a few minutes. The speed change is small, just enough to drop the lowest point of the orbit into the atmosphere, but that is all you need to fall out of orbit. The belly faces the fire. Temperatures spike above 1600 degrees Celsius on the leading edges. Thousands of black and white silica tiles and reinforced carbon-carbon panels shield the aluminum structure. Friction bleeds speed. The spaceship becomes a glider. No engines, just lift and drag. S turns carve away energy. Final approach is steep. Touchdown is fast and heavy. On paper, this should have been the win of the century. NASA planned up to 50 launches a year, 20 times 20, 30 million dollars per flight. Each orbiter flying hundreds of missions. Spaceflight as a schedule, not a spectacle. Turn it around, roll it back out, and do it again. That was the promise behind reusable. Reality had other ideas. Reuse didn't equal cheap, it equaled complex. After every flight, armies of technicians combed over more than 24,000 heat shield tiles, 
Many needed inspection, treatment, or replacement. The three main RS-25 engines came out, were taken apart, scrutinized, and rebuilt. The solid rocket boosters were towed back from the ocean, disassembled, cleaned, inspected segment by segment, packed with new propellant, and reassembled. The giant external tank, you built a new one every time. Months of turnaround hid behind every reusable launch. The cadence never showed up. The fleet averaged four to five flights a year. Cost per flight ballooned past a billion dollars once you account for program overhead total program cost climbed toward $200 billion over three decades. Cost per kilogram to orbit beat very few expendable rockets in service at the time. The shuttle's reusability, as implemented, didn't pay off at the cash register. And it wasn't safe enough. January 28, 1986, a cold Florida morning, ice on the pad, Challenger lifts off. 73 seconds later, the vehicle breaks apart. The cause is stark. Rubber O-rings in a solid booster joint had hardened in the cold and couldn't seal. Hot combustion gases escaped, impinged on the external tank, ruptured it, and the stack was lost. Seven people died. Engineers had warned clearly about the cold. Those warnings were overruled by schedule pressure and optimism. February 1, 2003. Columbia returns from a science mission. During launch, a chunk of foam insulation from the external tank struck the left wing, punching a hole in the heat shield's reinforced carbon-carbon. On re-entry, superheated plasma entered the wing and destroyed it from within. Seven more people died. Similar foam strikes had happened before without catastrophic results. That pattern bred a fatal habit, treating a known anomaly as acceptable because it hadn't killed anyone yet. There's a name for it, normalization of deviance. None of that erases what the shuttle did right. Hubble's images changed how we see the universe. The ISS exists at the current scale because the shuttle lifted, placed, and powered up building-sized parts in orbit. The program proved you can treat spaceflight like a sustained endeavor, not a one-off stunt. It trained generations of engineers and astronauts. It built international partnerships. It pushed materials, engines, avionics, and operations forward. So why did we stop? Here's your one-sentence answer. The shuttle's wings and tiles added mass and maintenance that killed cadence and cost, while its side-mounted solid-assisted design locked in risks you couldn't always abort. Modern rockets reuse the most expensive bits, keep shapes simple, fly often, and win on economics. The Columbia moment still gives us goosebumps, the roar, the light, the audacity. But the industry didn't stop there. It learned, it pivoted, it found that the shortest path to affordable, routine spaceflight doesn't need wings. It needs focus, it needs cadence, it needs the humility to reuse what pays and retire what doesn't. If this gave you clear, usable insight, if you can now explain why rockets beat shuttles on cost and spot the choices that drive safety and price, share it with the space fan in your life. And if you want more deep visual breakdowns of space and aviation, subscribe and stick around. We've got a lot more launches to decode together.